Well, I mean, thank you very much for uh, the invitation to speak here and, uh, and for organizing a summer school in my living room. It's uh, super convenient. Excellent, guys. Uh, okay, so, right, so the title is maybe a little bit uh, cryptic, but I, right, so maybe I will convince you, hopefully, that it's, uh, the result is not so much. Um, okay, so let's really try to get there. So first of all, of course, well, let me just, uh, that's why I prepared the, uh, the first few uh, things which I want to say, because they're all obvious, because you've been listening for more than five minutes. So I will, what I want to talk about is uh, some results in motivic homotopy theory. So in particular, I'm interested in this uh, category of motivic spaces. What's a motivic space? Well, it's a special kind of uh, pre sheaf valued in spaces. And so a pre-sheaf on the category of smooth varieties and uh, such a pre-sheaf, which happens to be a sheaf. So I will always be dealing with Nisnevich sheaves. Uh, Nisnevich topology is, uh, well, it's some sort of topology, which is somehow relevant. It's the correct one for various reasons. It doesn't, it doesn't matter hugely right now what it is. And then, of course, there's going to be some extra condition because um, it would be silly to have like two names for the same thing. And the extra condition is this so-called uh, A1 invariant, right? So you just you'd look at all those sheaves f such that if you evaluate it on some smooth variety x, or if you evaluate it on x times a1, you get the same thing. And this is, a, this is the so-called category of motivic spaces. Um, so there are, of course, supposed to be lots of motivic spaces because, uh, well, supposedly studying these categories uh, will, will tell us good things about the world, by which I mean polynomial equations. Um, right, so for example, if I take any smooth scheme whatsoever, then I can try to, well, it, it will not usually, as a pre sheaf of course, it will live here, but it may not be here. But you can just sort of brutally move it into this category because this inclusion has a right adjoint, which is called the motivic localization. And that's, that's, the, that's the obvious thing to do. But usually I will not even write this L mode and I will not write this Uneda embedding thing. I will just say view X as a, oh, well, this is uh, not what I was gonna say. But what I want to say is I want to view X as a motivic space, and this just means that you should do this localization, which in general is, of course, highly non-trivial, but just I want you to please imagine doing it. And then there's, a, there's another class of examples, which is going to be very important for my talk, um, which is, let's say you take some sheaf of abelian groups, right? So in this category here, you take somehow the simplest possible objects, well, of those which are, I mean, you do, right? So not sheaves of spaces, you now make them zero truncated, but you give them some extra structure, this abelian group structure. So that seems like a pretty reasonable thing. And then you could ask, is it the case that this, um, that this sheaf actually lives in the category of motivic spaces? And I mean, th th that's not always true. There's a condition, and I mean, it's just this condition here, but maybe for a sheaf of abelian groups, this looks a little bit more uh, familiar. It just says that if you take F, you evaluate it on X, or you evaluate it on X times A1, and you should just get the same abelian group. Uh, okay, so this maybe was not very exciting. So what else can you do with the uh, abelian groups? Well, you can look at their eilenberg maclean spaces, or in this case, I can look at the eilenberg maclean sheaf, K and F, right? So this is going to define some sheaf of spaces by, by, by definition. Um, and then I can ask again, does it live in this category of motivic spaces? And well, you need this homotopy invariance property. And what does it mean to evaluate some, um, some eilenberg maclean sheaf on a, uh, on a smooth variety, you get some space, the homotopy groups of which are the cohomology groups. So in this case, the condition is that um, this cohomology HI of X times A1 with coefficients in F should be the same thing as the cohomology of X with coefficients in F, and this should hold for all I less than or equal to. And so you see, in principle, as you make this N bigger, you get some more interesting object and you get, get a more stringent condition. And then it's uh, somehow natural to single out um, those pre sheaves or the, those sheaves of abelian groups where I can do this for all n at the same time. And those are called strictly A1 invariant. Um, right, so let's, let's just leave it at that. Okay, so now we come somehow to, to something which is close to the heart of the whole thing, which of course, classically, you have this notion of connectivity. Of, the, of a space, right? I already implicitly used it by saying that like an eilberg maclean space is somehow particularly simple. And what, 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 this, what this has to do with is that you some sort of sphere and you build how you can 
attach spheres to your spaces, for example. And more typically, we somehow we have two spheres. Again, I'm sure you know this, right? So there's the usual sphere, usual circle, if you want, circle. And then there's a, somehow some algebraic circle, which is denoted GM. And I mean, it's just you take the complement of zero in the affine line, and uh, let's say you point at one, and then these spheres, they define your pointed motivic spaces, which, well, they're, they're a bit like spheres somehow. For example, I mean, the complex points, of course, of GM is just C minus the origin, which has the homotopy type of S1. So it looks like it's just the same thing, but somehow this is a very topological observation and um, algebraically they're different. And then, what this tells you is that you somehow get two notions of um, connectivity out of this whole thing, right? You can measure connectivity somehow in terms of S1, or you can measure it in terms of GM. And I mean, there's no reason for these, for these to agree in general. Now, I just said there's no reason for them to agree, so let me contradict myself. So here's, a, here's an important example. If I take a smooth scheme, and I take some closed-up scheme, but it doesn't have to be smooth. And, um, but I will assume that it has a co-dimension at least D everywhere. And uh, if you do this, well, I mean, whether you do this or not, uh, you, can, you can look at sort of the formal tubular neighborhood of, of Z and X, right? So I do this thing, X mod X minus Z. Um, Right, so X is a smooth scheme, so it defines a motivic homotopy type, and X minus C is a smooth scheme, defines a homotopy type. So I can take the, the co-fiber of the inclusion, this defines some motivic homotopy type. And um, yeah, I mean, if Z was smooth, then you should think of this as some sort of algebraic version of a tubular neighborhood. And if Z is not smooth, then I don't know, it's still some algebraic version of a tubular neighborhood, but maybe a bit harder to imagine. And it turns out that this guy, I mean, if I view this, as a pointed space. This uh, is D minus one connected. D minus, that's not the right word, D. And uh, well, it's a D minus one connected in the S1 direction or in the GM direction. It turns out in both directions. Okay, so how do you see this? Well, first is let's say that the Z is smooth, and then there's something called the homotopy purity theorem, which basically says that this really does behave like a tubular neighborhood, and it tells you that it looks basically like a tome space of some, I mean, like the tome space of some vector bundle, and so it means that locally somehow it looks like uh, this sort of thing, A1 mod GM, which is P1, and which is somehow, which is S1 smash GM. So the point is, Locally, it looks like it's uh, connected, or I mean, if it's dimension D, then it's gonna be S1 to the, I mean, it's SD smash GM to the D. And so, so locally, it looks uh, connected in both directions, and then somehow the way the topology works, this Nisnevich topology works, the motivic commutative theory is that this also implies that it's globally connected in the sense. And um, so what if Z is not smooth? It turns out that there's some sort of filtration argument, and you find that this result is still true. Okay, um, so this will somehow play, play a big role in what is to follow. And now we can, we can look again at our favorite uh, strictly homotopy invariant sheaves, right? So F strictly homotopy invariant, right? So then my F defines a particularly simple type of motivic space. <coughs> and then what happens is that this space is discrete in the S1 direction. Okay, so it looks like the simplest possible thing which you could deal with in this direction, but it doesn't have to be in the uh, GM direction. So somehow there's some, some, some structure going on which is masquerading, but yeah, so it's not immediately obvious, but it turns out that there's some more things going on. Okay, but not in general in the uh, GM direction. And I mean, I'm not sure that I have anything. There's a question for you, Tom. Yes, I saw the question. Is there a nice reference for this filtration argument when Z is not smooth? 
Um, probably, but not off the top of my head. So, I mean, also when I make this claim, I'm saying that it's going to happen in the category of S1 spectra, if you know, like these sorts of details. I'm not claiming this in the sort of completely unstable sense, if I want to be very precise. Um, so I'm sure I can find you one if you email me. I can find something, but not, not right now. Uh, if I clearly remember something, uh, is at the end of uh, Reundix Earthware Advances Mass uh, paper, but uh, at the end of the paper, uh, this filtration argument. Okay, thank you. Where was I? Yes, okay, so I was, I was trying to explain why it's not always the case that these guys, right, so if I take one of these guys, why is it not always somehow connected in the GM direction? And I mean, I, I think just because there's no reason for it to happen, right? There are these two directions and you picked something which by definition was sort of discrete in the, in the one direction, why would it be in the other direction also? Um, so you can just work out some examples and you see that it's happened. So let me introduce some notation. So in general, let's see a sort of a spectrum, for example, it would be um, discrete if and only if its loops vanish, right? So it seems important to study the, the GM loops of this guy. So if this is always zero, then we would learn that these guys are always somehow discrete in the GM direction, but it's not, so let's give it a name. So this is called F minus one, or Swoboyevsky's contraction construction. And the point is that this need not be zero. And they, right, so now let me just give you an example. So what you can do is you can work out, this is not totally trivial, that F minus, that this, that this loop space is again just a, a sheaf and its section over let's say k is given by f of a1 minus zero mod f of k. And I mean, you can put x instead of k and that's an obvious modification of this formula. And then you can just, that there are some strictly homotopy invariant sheaves which we know, for example, the width sheaf. Um, so you take the pre-sheaf which assigns to some, let's say smooth variety, it's a width group or width ring. And then you take the associated sheaf in the, in, in the, in the Snavish topology, and this out, turns out to be strictly homotopy invariant, it's not obvious. And um, what you can compute, what one can manage to compute is that if you do this contraction business, you just get the width guy again. And this is not zero. <laughs> so, and uh, also another very famous example is this KN Milner width, so the unramified Milner width K theory. And also, if you contract it down, they're never zero and they form like this, well, this infinite GM loop sheaf. Um, okay, so. This is just something which happens and which may be surprising at the beginning, but okay, so we, we got to live with this. Now I want to put on my, my topologist's hat for a little bit and think about, think about loop space theory. And so one slogan, which I have picked up, is that somehow taking loops increases structure. Let me just scroll this out here. Increases structure. So what do I mean by this? Well, I mean, if X is a topological space, let's say pointed, right? And then I take the usual loop space. Now this has more structure, right? Because loops can be composed. So in other words, this is some sort of monoid. And if you want to be fancy, this is an E1 monoid or A infinity. Okay, so this is somehow the beginning of classical finite loop space theory. Um, so if you take uh, higher loops, right? So if I put an N here, then I make this an EN monoid. And somehow the point is that in fact, this is all the, ex this extra structure recovers everything. So that's somehow the crux of finite loop space theory. Or the, 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 the most basic result, I'm sure there are very difficult things which one can study. Um, so now what I want to claim is that if I do the same thing with my strictly homotopy invariant sheaf F and I do this in the GM direction, I still get more structure. So let's take F strictly homotopy invariant. Right now, let me look at the first loop. So I will denote it F minus one for reasons of tradition. And now what's clear, well, what's almost clear is that this is gonna be a module over somehow stable maps from uh, GM to GM. And the point is this thing has been computed by Morel to be the Groton degree ring of K. Okay, so what you learn is that this F, this F, I mean, it was just some arbitrary, yeah, so the, the F, it was just some strictly homotopy invariant sheaf, which uh, 
someone has given you, and you contract it down once, and now suddenly everything becomes a module over the Grotendieck width ring, which I mean can be a moderately complicated ring, and it's just just some extra structure which somehow pops out of the sky, and uh, maybe it will be useful. And there's the, this, there's also more. So there's also something called um, well, I will call it monogenic transfers. And I don't want to go uh, into too much detail exactly what this is. So what it does is, um, if you have some field, let's say finitely generated over K, and then you have some finite monogenic extension, right? So this is a finite extension, and you've chosen a generator, then this yields a transfer map sort of tau x from f evaluated k of x goes to f evaluated k, right? So this is somehow some fancy way of adding things together in, in some special way. And that we, will, we will see later some other incarnation of this. But all I'm saying is that right, so also in our motivic setting, it turns out that if you do take GM loops, you do find more structure. And um, so what I was saying here is that classically, if you recover enough structure, then somehow this loops, yeah, then, then, then you can reverse this loop operation, right? So I do this omega n thing, and it goes, let's say, from n minus 1 connected spaces. And then I go to en monoids. Monoids, as I said, this is somehow some, some way of encoding the fact that the first loop space has a multiplication, the second loop space, the multiplication becomes commutative, and then higher loop spaces it becomes more and more commutative. This is actually an equivalence. So if you give me only, only the en monoid, which was the loops on your space, then I can actually reconstruct this space. And I mean, you just gave me everything. Um, okay. And so what this tells you, for example, is that, um, oops, why is this not, okay, right, so if you have some, if x is n connected, I guess n minus one connected, then, and y is arbitrary, then if you do maps from x into y, well, first of all, this only depends on the n minus one connected cover of x, um, yeah, of y, only on x and well, sort of the n minus one connected cover of y. But then, of course, I can. I've already learned that the n minus one connected cover only depends on the loops. So I can put an omega n here, and I can forget about the covering. Whatever it doesn't change anything as an em monoid. Okay, so this is uh, maybe a bit of an esoteric observation. But if you do make this observation, you could. I mean, right, so now we have motivic uh, homotopy theory and how does this work? Well, usually something which works classically has, a, has, a, has an analog, hopefully emotivically. And then sometimes if you're very lucky, you can prove this anal analogous thing and then deduce some interesting result about algebraic varieties. That's, that's somehow secretly the plan of how motivic homotopy theory is supposed to be useful. So now let's try to think about this analog while well, you might guess the following thing based on that, right? So I put, I put some motivic space here, which is highly connected. Um, what do I take? Well, I take my x mod x minus z, right? From the first example, uh, co-dimension of z greater than or equal to d. And now I'm going to map it uh, into something else. And let me put k and f here, right? And so now remember this guy here is um, D, ah, so it should be a D, right? So this guy here is D connected in both directions. So if you believe that this analog somehow should hold, it tells me that this, this set of map, I mean, this homo cla homotopy classes of maps thing, it should only depend on the default loop space of this guy in both directions with its extra structure remembered. Okay, so it only depends on Well, if I take the default loops in the S1 direction here, I just get back F and I remember that it's a sheaf of abelian groups. And then if I detect the default loops in the GM direction, I get F minus D. F minus D with its extra structure. 
Ups, warte, das war Joe. Okay, so we have to somehow figure out what we think is all the, all the possible extra structure and what we think is all the structure, i.e. the transverse plus GW module structure. I mean, of course, uh, we don't know this. Maybe there's more, which nobody has discovered, but right, unless you, unless you provide me with more, more structure, which it could, cause, could possibly depend on, I will just guess maybe that's all there is. And it turns out that that's true. <laughs> so we do not have motivic finite loop space theory. Certainly we do not have this, but I mean, of course, this is an extremely special case. And you might imagine tackling this by other means, and uh, you can. So this follows from a theorem of Morel. Um, ah, so let me, right, so before I do this, let me observe that um, this set of homotopy classes here, this actually has a, has a more sort of classically algebraic interpretation because it's just the same thing as taking cohomology, right? So mapping into this guy here is taking cohomology. So this is some HD of something with coefficients in F. And now I'm mapping out of X mod X minus C, which means I take cohomology of X with support in C. Okay, and so now this topological statement here, or this statement coming from topological intuition, it says that this cohomology group somehow only depends on the contraction of F. And uh, when you get there and you know some things about motivic cohomotopy theory, you will easily see that this is true. Um, and so Morel, well, I mean, you, you will see this is true because of some difficult results. So Morel says or proves that the so-called Voss-Schmidt complex, so now we get to the title. Uh, so it looks a bit like this. This is some, you take your F and you view this as a sheaf on the Lisnevich side of X, and then you can resolve it. So it's C0 X F C1 of X F, and it keeps going. And uh, this, this, this computes cohomology. Okay, so this is not um, this is not super happy yet. I will try to answer your question in a second, Sean, um, because I mean I need to tell you something about what these CIs are. But so the point is, so this computes cohomology, and so roughly what are these CIs? Roughly what I want to say is that the CD of XF, this is going to be the sum over all the points of codimension D and X of the default contraction evaluated at x. So this is not literally true, but it is morally true. And this is right. So, and then there's a differential and it uses transfers and stuff. But the point is you can check explicitly, right? So now what, is it, what does it mean to take cohomology with, coefficient, uh, with support in Z? It just means that I have to sum here, not over things which are uh, of code dimension D, but also inside Z. Right, and the effect is just that you chop off the first d minus one term. So this one goes away, this one goes away, and so on and so forth. And so you find <laughs> you find some complex, and the terms well, it starts with f minus d of something, and then you take f minus d minus one of something, and so on and so forth. And so uh, you can easily convince yourself that also this differential, which has some explicit form, it says you well, you do something, you pull back to here, and you transfer, and you multiply, and it's, it's a big mess, but you never use anything. Uh, which is not already encoded in f minus d. And well, that's how you see that this, this topological guess here it turns out to be true. So now what was Sean's question? Can we view the extra structures coming from the... So I, I, I don't think so. So it's important that, that you do this with... Um, with, uh, with, with support. So it comes from the fact that somehow you're supported in high co-dimension. Oh, the extra structure on F minus D. I still don't see how to get this out of the fact that HD with coefficients in F is a group. I mean, it, it comes from the fact, no, I mean, it comes from the fact that GM somehow has special proper, right? So special maps of GM give you special structure on the loop space. So I don't see how this is really related with, um, with cohomology. 
So the, the, I feel like this would more give you extra structure in this sort of S1 direction, but we're dealing with sheaves of abelian groups, so it has already all the extra structure in the S1 direction. One of the Okay, so now we had this topological guess here, and I explained to you that maybe for some esoteric reason you want to convince yourself that this is true, and then Morel has proved that this is true. But I mean, categorically minded people that we are, of course we expect all of this stuff to be functorial, right? So if I change x to some other variety, then obviously these isomorph, I mean, then there's going to be some pullback map, and clearly this also only has to depend on, on the contraction. So that seems obvious enough. So this is sort of this obvious question, but what about pullback? Right, so let me let me amplify this. What do I mean? Right, so we let somehow, I don't know, let f from y to x be some morphism of smooth schemes and let uh, z contained in x closed, whoa, closed, sorry, co-dimension greater than or equal to d. And uh, then I have to assume, of course, that the pullback also has co-dimension greater than or equal to d. This is not automatic. Um, and I let my f be one strictly homotopy invariant sheaf. Okay, so then there's this pullback map. Okay, I mean, that's because it's cohomology support, it's functorial by definition, it's whatever abstract definition you use with like injective resolutions or whatever. And uh, so this group here only depends on the contraction, uh, right, on F minus. Clearly, obviously, this map only depends on F minus D with the extra structure. Okay, so this only depends on F minus D plus transfers. Let me just write, so this is just some shortcut for all this extra structure which we discovered. And um, right, so when, 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 I, when I came to this, this little exercise about the topological expectations and I noticed that Fabian has already proved it, I was very happy um, because, well, this, this would allow me to solve some interesting problem. And I assumed that surely just souping it up a little bit, whatever we've done so far, it, it should, give you, should give you this. And um, so I will tell you in a little bit what I was hoping to do, but it turned out that I spent many hours, days and nights trying to do this obvious thing and uh, I could not do it or it took me a very, uh, very, very long time. So this turns out somehow either I'm a bit dumb or this is much harder or equally hard as proving this. It does not at all follow obviously. So let me note this, this theorem. And this is what the, this is the theorem which the title of the talk is about, right? So the pullbacks for the Ross Schmidt complex exactly is supposed to say, well, how do you want to uh, right? So what you would want to think is that there's some th some map which you do on this uh, Ross Schmidt complex, and that should tell you how to do the pullback, and then you should easily deduce this result here. Um, and it's true at least if D is, let's say, two, then there's somehow a map which you can write down on this partial ross schmidt complex, which you think should be the pullback, and it would have the desired property, but it's very difficult somehow to prove that this map which you do write down indeed is the map which you're supposed to write down. Um, and basically, that's what the theorem is about. Um, okay, so I hope the statement makes sense. So let me interject for a little bit. Oops. So who the hell cares? I feel like that, that would be a very reasonable question. I mean, oh, to some extent, of course, we're just testing the waters of a um, motivic finite loop space theory. I think by itself, this is a reasonable thing, but maybe also it would be fair to say it's a little esoteric, but so let me, let me give you one corollary, which one can obtain from this. So this is in joint work with Maria Jakobson. And it says the following. So, so we're working over perfect field K. I should have said this from the beginning. So K is always perfect for all the non-trivial results. Um, okay, so let, let me fix some motivic space. 
on point emotive space. Now, what can I do? What I can do is I can try to stabilize this guy, right? So spaces are hard. Let's make it simpler. And how do you make it simpler? Basically, by somehow by smashing with P1, right? By smashing with both the directions of um, um, connectivity with S1 smashed here. So what I can do is I take my X and then I map it to uh, omega P1 sigma P1 X. Okay, and so in some sense, classically, what happens is that this sort of Freudenthal suspension theorem, which tells you that somehow this map here, um, depending on maybe the connectivity of X, it will induce an isomorphism on some homotopy groups. And uh, yeah, this is this sort of stabilization phenomenon. And once you observe this, in, in fact, what you do is you do this a bunch of times. Uh, let's say I do this n plus one times here. And I do it n times here. And basically you want to take the co-limit of this whole system, right? And then this is going to be the, right? So this co-limit here, this is going to be the stabilization. And this, this space at the end somehow, this is supposed to be the simpler version. And um, so the point of the Freudenthal suspension theorem is that if you just do this, right? So you're starting with X and then you're doing a bit more and a bit more, da, 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 da. and the point is that somehow these, these homotopy groups, they will stabilize. So there is this nicer stable answer at the end in the infinite, infinitely far, but actually you already reach it at the finite stage. So that's, that's I would say, a very important result in classical topology, which unfortunately we do not have an equivalent of motivically. And so, <laughs> so this esoteric result here, it can be used to prove that um, this map here, well, Freudenthal says that you should get an isomorphism on the uh, first couple of homotopy groups, depending on how high up you go. And uh, so we can do this now on pi zero, <laughs> which of course is much, much weaker than the, what you would hope for. But it says that this is an isomorphism if n is greater than or equal to three. Right, so you can imagine you have your space, you have x, and then you have loops sigma x, and you have loops squared sigma squared x, and so on and so forth. And then you reach the stabilization here sigma infinity x somehow. And pi zero of sigma infinity x is going to be the same thing as pi zero of uh, sigma three uh, omega, no, omega three sigma three x. So this, this stabilization, this Freud entire thing, which is supposed, of course, to happen for all homotopy sheaves somehow, at least on pi zero, it does happen, and it happens at uh, three steps. So I would, I would like to believe that this is, a, this is quite a nice result, and that hopefully it would justify expanding energy trying to prove this. Okay, so now the rest of my time I would like to spend trying to indicate to you how to prove this theorem. I mean how to prove this theorem. So I will not indicate how you get, uh, right, so I won't do this because, well, that would be another half hour, but um, so I will try to do this. And uh, at least for my taste, this is basically some sort of pretty, pretty hardcore algebraic geometry. But OK, so let, let's try. So how do we prove the theorem? Well, I mean, it's, it's, it's going be, it's going to be a struggle. We have to fight. Now there, there, first of all, there are some easy cases. So there's an easy case, which is when f is smooth, or more generally, it's flat. But somehow it doesn't. Flatness somehow does not help. This is. I don't believe this is known to fail. I mean, maybe it's it's known not to like work in the most optimal bounds which you could guess. But I don't know. I don't think anyone knows these things to fail. But um, we do. We, we we can't prove it. Yeah, that was a question if this, if this stabilization result, which I proved for pi zero, will it also hold, is it known to be false for higher homotopy sheaves? And I, I believe it's not known to be false. I'm sure everyone believes it to be true, but we, we don't know how. Okay, so the easy case is if, S, if S, F is smooth. And the reason is that in this case, there's a pullback map on the entire Rostschmidt complex 
without supports, and it's compatible with um, the pullback in F because I mean basically you build it to do that, and then the universal property sort of of what the resolution means immediately tells you that everything works. So smooth maps, super easy. Um, there's another easy case which I don't want to treat, which is if your F is a, what's called a homotopy module or an infinite loop sheet. And the reason is that in this case, I told you there's this fantasy formula which you want to write down, but it uses transfers, and then you have a problem because you don't have transfers on C0, so you cannot make this map. But if you have an infinite loop sheet, then you have transfers on C0, and again, you can then use this construction of ROS to write down the pullback map, and you can check that this does everything that you want. And so basically the problem in general is that you cannot somehow write, a, write down this map on the Ross Schmidt complex because there's some, somehow in degree zero, you don't know what to do. But you can write it down in the higher degrees, but then you have to somehow argue that it's still correct. Um, so here's a key observation. So I'm not going to use the, the, the fact about homotopy modules because somehow the whole point of this result is to prove it for, for all strictly homotopy invariant sheaves. Um, and they are definitely not all homotopy modules. So the key, one key observation is as follows. Very simple. Um, so let's say I have my Z contained in X, put dimension greater than or equal to D. And then what I do is I look at the generic points of Z. And I only look at those, let's say, of co-dimension d on x right so every generic i mean every point of z has co-dimension at least d on x so i'm looking at those which have like the smallest possible co-dimension not every generic point needs to do this because i mean it could be stupid things like z is a union of two things and one is much smaller so it has higher co-dimension but okay so let's typically x is some smooth guy z is some closed integral guy and then there's just one generic point and whatever and then what you do is you look at you look at this map, H, D with support in Z, X, F. And then I map it to this, H, D with support in Z. Okay, so what I do is I hensalize my X in this, in this generic point. So that's, <laughs> it need not be a close point of X at all. So this is maybe some sort of slightly iffy algebraic thing to do, but Okay, so that's the beauty of algebraic geometry. We can do some slightly iffy things. And okay, so here the support Z should maybe Z intersected with X, H, Z, I, but I mean, it's gonna get really annoying to write. And so the point is twofold. One is that this map is an injection. Right, and the reason is just that you look at the ross schmidt complex here, right? So what if I do cohomology with support in uh, Z, it means I chop off the first couple of terms, namely the first D minus one terms. So it's going to inject into this thing here. And what, what do I see? Well, I see exactly those points of co-dimension D which lie in Z and I do the default contraction. And so since the hensalization does not change the residue field, this map is in an injection. And the other point is that, that this map from the hensalization to X is basically pro et al. So up to some pretension, pretending it's, it's, it's at all. So in particular, it's basically one of these smooth maps which we understand. So pullback is understood. Okay, so what this means is that in general, whenever I have to somehow pull, I write I have to pull back along some arbitrary map, I can at least sort of shrink this target in some et al neighborhood of certain points. And this hopefully will allow me to make it uh, simpler. So, so what I want to say, or how I want to summarize this, is that somehow this problem is local. In some specific sense. Okay. So now, now we come to the, to the real thing. So I will want to explain, yeah. So I want to sketch the proof of the following lemma. This says as follows. So I assume that the field has characteristic zero. And I let 
y and x essentially smooth. So this is just some trickery which allows me to look at something like the hensilization. It's not quite a smooth scheme, but it's reasonably close to one. And I give myself some map from y to x, which is in fact a closed immersion. Of code I mentioned one. And then of course I have to give myself a z contained in x co-dimension greater than or equal to d. And I have to assume that if I intersect it with y, contained in y still has co-dimension greater than or equal to d. And I give myself some f, skip the homotopy invariant. And then I have to prove, and this is what I want to prove then, this pullback map, i upper star hd with support in z. Uh, xf for hd supporting z intersect y i suppose uh, yf and i will call this thing here w this only depends on f minus d plus transfers let's say okay so this is this is a special case of the main theorem it's a special case a because i'm assuming that the characteristic is zero and b because i'm assuming that this map f is um is a regular immersion of co-dimension a closed immersion of co-dimension one so this this is not a huge deal because uh, well we've already dealt with smooth maps so i can i can reduce to right so every map composes uh, can be written as a composite of a smooth map and the regular immersion so you have to deal with regular immersions and the problem is also local so uh, i can factor it locally as a composite of the co-dimension one immersions so you reduce to this co-dimension one case easily. Um, the characteristic zero assumption is somehow serious. So I'm going to say some things and that they don't quite work in positive characteristic. You have to argue more carefully, but something along the same lines also works, except you have to deal with annoying things like, uh, well, regular not being the same as smooth and blah, blah, blah. So I, I, this is, yeah, so I have only a, finite amount of time and energy to explain things to you. And I think focusing in characteristic zero somehow, uh, it's already complicated enough, your argument. Okay, so we have 15 minutes. I hope that we can, that I will be able to convey some ideas to you. So what do we do? Um, so the first step we reduce to the case where, um, X has dimension D plus one. Then of course, Y has dimension D and uh, Z has dimension one. And of course, then W has dimension zero and I want to assume that it's just one point and it's a rational point. Um, okay, so how do, you, how do you do this? Somehow this is, this is some sort of standard trickery so what you do is um, you replace X by the hensilization, right? So, I mean, what I do is, of course, I pick, right? So I pick my W in W, um, a point of co-dimension D in Y, right? Because the problem was local somehow in Y, right? Because of this business here, the problem is local on points of co-dimension D in Y and W. So I pick this point and I, I just have to look somehow locally around this point and I replace X by the hensilization in this point. And of course I also replace Y by the hensilization in this point and Z by the hensilization in this point. Um, okay, and then it's a, it's a sort of standard fact that this, this inclusion here then it admits in retraction. Okay, so this is not immediately obvious, but I mean, there are algebraic ways of seeing this, there are geometric ways of seeing this. Just please believe me that this is the case. And now, of course, because we're in characteristic zero, this guy is regular and this guy is any field whatsoever. So this map here is going to be smooth. Oh, uh, well, essentially smooth. <laughs> uh, okay, so now what have I done? Uh, well, I have localized in this point, so you will see that these dimensions things happen automatically, and I've right, and I replace k by, of course, the residue field of uh, w, <laughs> and so by this 
by this trickery, I have assumed that I can now assume that this W is a, indeed a rational point. It's just, I mean, the, the statement is so general and it's, it's, it's going to be hard enough. So we, we, we make our lives a bit more reasonable. Okay, so now I still want some further reductions. Um, so I can assume that uh, actually X and Y are smooth. Right, so in the assumptions, and also because I did the sensualization business here, I only said it's essentially smooth, so it's some co limit of smooth schemes. But I mean, all of these things, they're gonna happen sort of at the finite stage in this co limit. And so you can always, uh, and then there's some continuity thing that the value on F also will be then the co-limit. And so, so you can always, things happen at some finite stage. So you can, you, know, you, you can assume that X and Y are actually proper, I mean, like, not, not proper, but like, real bona fide smooth schemes. And um, then I can assume the Z in principle could intersect um, Y in, in many points, but I can as well, I mean, I can just throw out all the others. So I can assume that Z intersect Y is just W. I guess it's already included here. And I can assume that Z is smooth away from Y, uh, away from W. Right, because I mean, Z is a curve in characteristic zero. It's only have, gonna have finitely many uh, singularities and I, I just throw out all of them except for W. So then Z will be smooth, well, no problem. Um, so now this Y into X is a, is a regular immersion of co-dimension one. So it's locally principled. So again, by working locally around this point W, I can uh, assume that Y is the vanishing locus of a single function. And finally, I can assume that X is affine. Again, all of this because it's somehow, it's a, it's a local problem. Okay, so I will admit that maybe it's not quite clear where we're going, but let me, let me try. So I'm gonna now make two claims, which basically are the heart of the proof and which I'm not going to prove because, well, time, attention span, various reasons. So the first claim is the following. I claim that there exists a function u bar from z to a1 having a bunch of good properties. Um, so first of all, I want it to not be zero at w. Um, secondly, I want this product u bar f, right? So it's also a function from z um, to a1. And this is gonna be finite. Um, okay, and also I want u bar not to have double roots. Well, on z, where else? <laughs> um, okay, so now how do you do this? It's basically a riemann roch argument. Plus using the fact, right? So you can use riemann roch somehow because it's mostly a smooth curve and this allows you to basically get all of this. And then how do you make sure it doesn't have double roots? It uses the fact that uh, fields of characteristic zero are infinite, right? Because I could always add some constant on it and then generically it would have no double roots. Um, okay, so let's believe this for now. And then what I do is I put phi one equal to this product. You go, ah, well, so I, what do I do? Sorry, I screwed up. All right, so I use the fact that um, this, this X is affine. So I pick some U from X to A1 extending U bar. And then I put phi one equals this U F from X to A1. Okay. And now here's the second claim. Um, the second claim is that there exist more functions. So there exist phi two, phi three, and so on, up to phi d plus one from x to a one, such that the following holds. Um, so I write phi, but all of them together, phi one to phi d plus one. Oh no, oh no. If 
right? So this is now a map from X to A to the D plus one, and it will satisfy a whole bunch of properties. Um, so phi of W equals zero, um, and phi is at all at all points of phi one inverse of the zero intersected with Z. Um, and then the very crucial thing is there exists an open neighborhood U contained in um, A1 over D such that if I base change U to there and I map it via phi to U times A1, this is going to be a closed immersion. And uh, so this maybe, if you know about these things, it looks like Gaber's lemma or like part of Gaber's lemma. And indeed, that's, that's where I got it from. And so you can prove this because you have an infinite field by a general projection argument. Okay, so now I'm sure you all remember all the 15 functions and schemes and everything that we had so far. But um, just in case that you don't, and also so that I feel like I'm, I'm telling you something, let me try to give you an artistic impression of what's going on. So I hope this is going to work and help, but let's try. So what had we done, right? So we had, my, we had our scheme X, our smooth scheme X. Now I only have two dimensions, so everything is only gonna be two dimensional. And so X is just gonna be some blob here, okay? So that's X. Now inside there, we had, uh, we had the Y, right? This was some smooth scheme of co-dimension one. So it's gonna be some sort of curvy thing here. So this is my Y, okay? What else did we have? Well, we had a Z, right? So we had some closed sub-scheme also of, co uh, of, of whatever, co-dimension D, but I mean, I, the only choice I have is, is also gonna be some one-dimensional guy. But it could have singularities. And it turns out that the, the, the problem mainly arises if the singularities of Z are meet Y. So this is sort of the kind of thing which is going to happen. So this is going to be Z. And then we had uh, the intersection with Y, which we call W. And the, the big deal is that our W is this point here, which is the singularity of Z. So this is what makes everything difficult. Okay, so this is what we had started with. Um, okay, so what else did we do? Well, the first thing which we did was, right, we cooked up this U. Um, so let's see, let me draw this in here. So the, zoo, the, the U, the, this will give me some, some other guy, right? So this is gonna be the vanishing locus of U. And this Y thing is, by the way, the vanishing locus of F. Okay, and then we had like lots of maps, the phi one up to phi D plus one. So there's some map which I call phi equals phi one up to phi d plus one. And uh, so this now goes to a n, of course, uh, a d plus one. So let me try to draw this. Again, I only have two dimensions. So this is somehow an a one here on the coordinate x one. And there's an a one here on the coordinate x d plus one. And then there are some more coordinates in the middle, of course, but I cannot draw them. And so what, what happened here? Well, what happened is that um, right, so the phi one was the product of u and f. So this x is here. Is the pre-image of that is going to be the union of the blue bits, right? So it's going to be the union of y and some extra thing. And um, so what else? We had the z. Now the z is going to do something. Uh, let me try to draw this. Maybe like this something like this okay so what's going on here well so the w the w is still here and still this uh, still this singular point we couldn't do anything and uh, but also what can happen is that this u right so this thing here this has some some could have some new intersections with z right so for example here so this we have uh, should i use some color let's use black right so there's here there's some new intersection maybe i call it little y1 so this i cannot avoid so this is some new intersection. But I had asked that it should not have double roots, so this is some new transverse intersection. And I said at the beginning that the problem is 
basically when the z has a singularity on the intersection so basically what i'm telling you is there's a new intersection but it's it's good we can understand it right and then also what we have said is that on some open neighborhood um, of this guy here the z should be a closed immersion right so now my z what was it it was this sort of curve here and it turned into that sort of curve here but now it has a new double point right so there's a problem here so that's one of my bad points somehow x problem but that's fine, right? So what this is saying here is that it should be a closed immersion locally in this coordinate. So I just throw out this point, right? So then I have my U. So this is just gonna be a, a D, which in this case is A1, I suppose. And I'm removing this finitely many bad guys, no problem. And then away from that, it's supposed to be a closed immersion. So maybe, maybe that's, that's what I'm doing. And so, so somehow, morally, what has, what has happened here is that we managed to straighten out the, the right, so the, the X and the Y, they were some arbitrary smooth schemes, and now we've somehow managed to straighten them out into, an, into, an, into a full A1. That's somehow what the, what the gap lemma always does. It gives, it, it gives you somehow enough room to get a full A1. Um, so at the expense of having sort of this, this new guy here, and these new guys here, which we now have to deal with. But if you take nothing away from my talk, then please somehow remember that, that the point of Gabber's lemma is to straighten out into an actual A1, whatever, whatever that means. So now I have four minutes to try and uh, finish the proof. So what do I do? One thing which I do is I let U0 be the intersection of U with um, the thing where the first coordinate is zero. So in our case, that's just this point here, but in general, there could be more dimensions. And then it turns out that there's some open subset here, which will be well chosen. And I will not tell you what it does, the choice. Um, and then the following thing is going to happen. So what do I do? Okay, so maybe, yeah, so maybe I will abbreviate this. And what I will say is, so more steps will tell you it suffices to understand um, the pullback somehow like this, H, D, Z, U, uh, A1 over U, F goes to H, D, uh, Z, U, zero, A1 over U, zero with coefficients in F. Right. So the whole exercise of this game was that I replaced the situation on the left by the situation on the right. Um, so how is this any better? Um, so one thing which we can observe is that this Z, it is finite over U, right? So this is some proper morphism. So what I can do is uh, ZU goes to U finite. It means that I can embed A1, of course, into P1, and then it will remain closed in P1. And so I can instead, I can instead, let's say, do this, right? So I can instead do this, P1. And it's also enough to understand this. And now what can I do? Um, okay, so I have this H, D, Z, U, P1 over U with coefficients in F. And I'm supposed to pull it back here to H, D, Z, U, zero. Um, P1 over U0 with coefficients in F. However, right, so this Z0, this is basically just finitely many points. So this group here, I can, I can work out using the Rosschmidt complex, right? So that's just M minus D of W. So that's this point. And then maybe there's some stupid other points, which we have to deal with. Plus, so a whole bunch of points, sum over I M minus D of YI. So these annoying new points. And now, now is where the transfer comes. So there is a transfer map here. And it, I mean, yes, let me write it. So it goes to HD P of CU, by which I mean just the image under the projection in this direction uh, with coefficient, uh, U with coefficients in F minus one. Right, so if you ignore, if you ignore the supports here, oh, that's it, of course, I did it wrong. 
right? So if you ignore the supports here, this is just saying what is HD uh, P1 over something coefficients in F, but you just use the fact that P1 is S1 smash GM. So you should remove one from the D and you should remove one from the F and that's how I got this. And you can check that you can play with the supports here. And this, it turns out, is, is basically the nature of the transfer. This is what the transfer is. And I can do the same thing. And then I can put back here, H D minus one P of Z U zero, um, U zero coefficients in F. And there's another transfer here. And this diagram commutes, it's very elementary. And uh, I can also work out this thing here. So this is M minus D of W again, because it's a rational point, plus maybe some other, some other things. Okay, and so now I'm out of time, but also um, I'm at the end, right? Because we had this, M yeah, right, so what does, the, what does the transfer do? I told you that this abstractly defined map, it has something to do with the transfer. And well, you can see here in this simple case, right? So this is some sum of M minus Ds evaluated at some points, and then they map down to some other points. And so you, what you need to do is that you need to find some kind of transfer. And I mean, that's, this construction here gives you a transfer. And that's exactly what this is. But now the point is we had designed this to be, right? So this, this W here is the same thing, was a rational point. So there's no field extension. So this is actually an isomorphism. Okay, so now I'm done, right? So I, I had something here, and I'm supposed to figure out what this is, its image here. So I need to figure out what it is here and here. Now, suppose that I know this map here, right? So I had something here, I know it here, I know it here, so I know everything here. And also, I had told you that these new points, they're somehow, they're somehow easy. So also, I know everything here. So basically, in this big group here, I know everything except for this value here. But I also know what happens if I transfer it down all the way to here, okay? But now, well, if I just pretend it's zero here for a bit, transfer all of these things down and subtract it off from what it's supposed to be and then invert this map here, I will find that I figure out what the last component is. And so then, uh, what have we done? Well, it suffices to understand this map. And uh, now we're done because by induction. Right, because I had I've now managed to reduce the D. And so now you can just go again and eventually you get to D equals zero and D equals zero is trivial. Um, yes, so I'm sorry for running over time, but I hope I have given you some idea of how algebraic geometry proves this interesting result in motivic commutative theory. Hey, thanks a lot for a wonderful talk, Tom. Left here. Um, let's see, are there any questions? Um, maybe I can start with a question in the corollary, the result with Maria Jakerson. Mm -hmm. There was a, I think there was a number three showing up. Yes. Is it possible to somehow explain how, why, why it's number three? Um, yes. So this number three has something to do with the following thing. Yeah, okay, so what, what about this three? So I, I'm not sure if it's optimal. So what is this, right? So it has to do with the following thing. You take F minus one has some transfers and F minus two has transfers. They all have transfers. And some feeling is that the transfer, this guy has transfers, better transfers, better, better transfers, Right, so just like how in EN, right, so if you take iterated loop spaces classically, you have like group structure, abelian group structure, E2, E4, whatever. And so the feeling is that eventually, so the F minus infinity should have fra frame transfers. Now actually, right, so and actually it turns out that already, already F minus three does. Have framed and uh, f minus two if characteristic is equal to zero. And the conjecture is that f minus one has frame transfers. <laughs> um, 
but so well, okay, so now that was a lot of waffling, but the, the point is that somehow the contractions give you more and more structure and we believe that you somehow get all structure already after three steps or after two steps or maybe after one step. And how many steps you need, this is the number, this is where this number comes from, right? So this number three is because you can prove that after three steps you're somehow at, the, at full structure. Okay, thanks. Then there's a question from Sean Tilson. He asks, uh, is there extra structure on the map that you have now from this scrollery, like more than the abelian group structure? Um, yes, I mean, yes. I mean, so, so one thing which you do learn is that, yes, so if you do pi zero of omega P1 cubed, uh, sigma p1 cubed f, right? This is actually a homotopy module. So this has all the structure which you could possibly ask for. In fact, in the proof, we learn this, right? So already if you, because I mean, this is like, if you take a threefold loop space and then you have good structure, this is not the like super exciting thing. But actually the point of the proof is that this already, right? Even without taking loops, you already have a lot of extra structure. Um, so the answer is yes, we definitely do get more structures on various things. And this is basically the heart of the proof. <laughs> um, is there an, uh, there's a question, is there an analog of maze recognition principle for motivic loop spaces? Well, uh, in the world, does there exist one? I hope so. Can we prove it? I believe not right now. So we have, right, so there, there's some, there's sort of S1 loop space theory, which says, can you de-loop it in the S1 direction? And I would argue that this is probably reasonably well understood. I'm not sure if it's like written down in this language, but we, this, this sort of thing we can probably do. But the de-looping de de in the GM direction is very, very hard. So we do not have, yeah, so we, we do not have recognition principle, recognition principle for even something like P1 loop spaces. I mean, you could ask for GM loop spaces, but the problem is that somehow, because GM is not connected itself, these things are sort of, it seems likely to me that you might have something like for P1 or P1 uh, to the smash two, da, 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 that for these you might have it, but we do not have any of these. Um, we, have, we do have a recognition principle for motivic infinite loop spaces, which is um, right. So, like, like saying that E infinity monoids group like E infinity monoids are infinite loop spaces. So we have something like that group like spaces with frame transfers, but we definitely do not have this at finite stages. Uh, if we did, then my result would be much easier, or I mean, as easy as proving this recognition principle. Yeah, please work on that and prove it. That would be great. You used um, characteristic zero uh, to prove your um, uh, your theorem, but it, characteristic zero doesn't appear in the hypothesis of the theorem. Yes, no, I, I mean, I did not, I, I used characteristic zero to make the already probably long and hard to follow argument a little less annoying. So in positive characteristic, you do something which is roughly the similar story, but this reduction in the beginning, so this point here, this then becomes a few pages to argue that you can still do something like this in positive characteristic. But um, yeah, so this is only, I, I did it to simplify the exposition and only prove a special case. I have another question. Um, uh, can you make a comment on the zero and pi zero of your, with your corollary with the acrosome? Well, what can I comment on? on what zero means or sorry I, I don't quite follow well uh could you change it to pi one no i, I well I would, I would like would to believe into? that but i don't, right so what we do very much is confined to pi zero so i think that yeah so i mean i would conjecture or whatever you would guess that i can do something like pi i here and then maybe n greater than I don't know, something 3i or 3 plus i, I don't know what it goes. So that, that, that would be what you think, or would, what, what I would think. But I suspect that this probably requires different 
different kind of attacks, but I don't know. So I definitely cannot, I wish I could, but I can't. Can you explain where the zero comes up in going from the transfer result to the corollary? Yes, I, I can, I can, I think, do that. Um, well, so how does this work? The way this works is that I look at somehow, right, so I look at the category of S1 spectra, and uh, then I have the category of motivic spectra. Right, so I can go to here and I can go to here and basically I want to figure out what this composition is. And uh, so I can imagine this is happening somehow in spaces, right? So I can first smash it with GM and go to them somehow to this, SH, S1, K1, and then I go to two. And I keep going and I can always factor it like this. Right, I mean, I'm just saying that if you do an infinite iteration of GM loops and GM suspensions, you can do one and one and one. And then, I mean, eventually you always have to do infinitely many. And what the, what the proof eventually shows is that if you look at the hearts here, um, that, right, so these categories in some sense, right, so the, this zero is one, then the first one, and so on and so forth, in a, in a way which I find difficult to make precise, they approximate this category. Well, I guess I can take some limit in the category, in PRL or something, but whatever. Right, and so what we prove is that S H S one of K N heart, right? So it has this natural functor S H of K effective heart, and this is an equivalence for N greater than or equal to three. And then um, eventually you get the corollary from that by some formal manipulations. And the way this works is that basically we know very explicitly what this guy is. And so we have to somehow describe these things very explicitly and while well, we just fight our way through and eventually we see that well, what, what are the objects in here? They're like these sheaves and they have some extra structure and then eventually we argue that this is all the structure. And so if you want to do it for let's say pi one, right? So then you don't have to look at the heart but you have to look at something like this, right? So SH of S1 of K sort of concentrated into degrees zero and one. So I don't know, some sort of motivic one types. And you could try to do the same analysis, but it's going to get much more complicated, right? And then you have to do it with three types. And yeah, so that, that's my attempt at answering your question. Okay, great. Are there other questions? Uh, yeah, yeah, just, just to understand more precisely. So you don't build uh, pullback maps on the ROS complex, but instead you prove uh, that's it. Instead, you prove this independence uh, results. Right. Is that Let right? Me, that, that uh, yes. I, well, I haven't really thought about that. So, or another detail. Yes. So maybe I should say, right, well, you have this thing, you have to say, say C0 of XF goes to C1 of XF goes to C2 of XF goes to, and so on and so forth. Right now you can do the same thing with Y. Okay, and then the dream would be that you have some maps here, <laughs> which make everything work. But the problem is that there is no transfer here and then you cannot write it down. So that's the problem. Okay, so, but instead, I mean, you can do the support in Z thing. Okay, and then, I mean, this, this guy just goes away. I mean, this just doesn't exist. And maybe some more don't exist. And then the point is there's this formula which Rust has written down how to do it. So there exists a map here and there exists one here and everything commutes, right? And so the easy, I mean, the, the ideal thing would be to prove that this is the correct thing. And I think what my result shows, but I have to, I have to think about that, is that um, sort of the lowest term, so if these are all zeros, right, then this map here, it does the correct thing. So that there, there's this map, which, this fantasy map, which you write down, but it will actually give you the thing which comes sort of implicitly out of what I'm doing with the transfer and whatever. And I'm, my feeling is that you might be able to soup this up to learn that by some induction thing that it, it does actually the correct thing, right? So that, that these maps here, which you can write down, that they all induce the correct map in cohomology, 
but I have not actually tried to do that. And I think it would be maybe annoying, but it's not, it's not out of the question. So I, I'm not sure, but I think, yeah, I, I, it says pullbacks for the rust mid complex and I definitely don't do this in general. I see, I see. Okay, thanks, thanks. Okay, anybody else? I think that concludes the question. So thanks again, Tom, for a wonderful talk. Okay, and the uh, next talk is at six. See you then. John also asked, are there negative stable homotopy sheaves? And uh, the answer is no. Okay, thank you. <laughs>